I remember the day we were supposed to hear whether we got accepted. Everybody else went home for lunch that day and looked in their mail and came back that afternoon and they had all gotten in. So I sat there all afternoon thinking, well, there's, the probability is I'm not getting in, you know? And I, I remember walking home that day and I remember my mother standing in, in our living room as I walked through the door and she was holding that letter and she had a smile on her face. And it's probably one of the fondest memories I have of my mother. I didn't know much about St. Louis U High when I, you know, and, you know, took the entrance test to get in. You know, I didn't know you got ranked on the entrance tests. I didn't know exactly what I was getting into. I just, I think it was really more driven by my parents than any great passion I had to go there. And then you, you show up, your first real experience is book day. Remember those things? And, and I look back now and probably spent a half a day running around begging to, to try to find a certain book I needed. When in, in reality, I could have just gone down to the bookstore, bought the book, and my parents would pay for it anyway. And I'm like, what? You know, but it was kind of a game and you got caught up in it. But I just remember the absolute chaos of that. But anyway, I show up and, and they get your homeroom thing or whatever. And I was in 101. And it was intimidating for a guy like me. I didn't, I didn't know any of these people. And some of them were athletes and some of them, you know, at Schweitzer, forget that. I, I still owe that guy for screwing up every curve of every test that I took with him. I'm going to get him for that one day. But it was, it was pretty intimidating. I wasn't a big guy, you know, I'm not, I'm not big now. So, it, and I, so I didn't shrink much, but, uh, no, I wasn't a big guy. I wasn't an athlete. And just to be in the class with those guys, it was intimidating, you know, for, especially at first, you know. And there were there were other guys that would I would, you know, like Joe Castellano, a very smart guy. But I would say more, he just a normal guy. And then there were some individuals in there that were, I'll, I'll just say a little quirky. At some point, uh, classes began and it was, it was a, a whole new world, obviously, right? Uh, it was uh, single sex education. Uh, I had never, you know, didn't know what that was going to be like. Uh, uh, that was fine. It wasn't nuns teaching you. And, and I had gone to a Catholic grade school in, in uh, Tuskegee where we had Dominican nuns. And in those days, there were enough nuns to, you know, teach every class. So uh, uh, having lay persons, you know, teachers was was a different sort of experience as, as well plus just getting you know a new city you know new classmates uh you know uh new top new subjects obviously a new routine uh it was all just you know so new uh if you saw that picture of the prep news team i i think maybe from senior year up on the uh, up on the roof that's kind of one of my favorite memories. I, I don't, I really kind of enjoyed, and it wasn't my idea. I'm never, I was, I've never been that creative. It was probably Lane or Ventrup or somebody that, that got us all up there. Uh, you know, the, the one, yeah, uh, kind, kind of my, my main point uh, with this um, is, is, is I think that, you know, I just found St. Louis U High so entertaining um, that that uh, ev you know every day I just look forward to going to school and um, uh, and and being entertained by some of the most interesting characters who you know who 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 um uh just collected there and and um you know talking you know probably mainly about faculty and staff um you know but but our class had some characters um in it who who definitely um uh added to the entertainment value um 
freshman field day stuck with me. And I don't see any pictures of freshman field day at Tower Grove Park, but that was one of the, after the, the big testing we took, I think we took it twice for some reason, one to make it into the school and then one to put us in categories, which I don't do anymore. Um, I don't remember anything being more um, impactful than freshman field day with Father Hagen. You know, we had 220 in the class. I guess there could have been 100 guys. But it was just like free-for-all stuff in games. And he had – you haven't heard him talk about that big ball, that big uh, – you know, it's like 10 feet high, and we would have not a tug-of-war, but a push-of-war. It was just – it was insane, and it was like, I've never seen anything like this. I went to little St. Michael the Archangel in Shrewsbury, and here's all these guys just having a ton of fun. It was just incredible. So uh, memorable events include my freshman year, very first pep rally ever, upperclassmen coming down the halls, banging drums, uh, hurting us out of the classroom, kind of looking at the teacher like, is this okay? And I think it was all pre-planned, but uh, ending up in the auditorium, guys screaming and yelling and then a senior uh, riding his motorcycle uh, into the auditorium was kind of just a, an amazing thing for a freshman to see. Biology class and again this is a Jim Shortle story because Jim's not here to tell his own so we can tell another one on Jim a good one. Jim uh, took David Brummett's rubber stoppers and he used to open the window and we were on the second floor and he would bounce them off the street. And Brummett would always be, he couldn't understand why he would come into class and all the rubber stoppers were gone. Jim had thrown them out the window. Class of 71 had some of the funniest people um, that I've ever met. Good sense of humor. And I think about the experience we had when the U High played, I think Rockhurst in Kansas City, and and the whole school got on a bus, got on buses, and went to Kansas City, and all of the trouble that we got into <laughs> during that 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 brief weekend, <laughs> you know, that was quite a trip, man. And in fact, I don't, I don't know if I don't remember whether you were with Bobby and me or not at the time, but we managed to sneak into this arcade where they, where they had the little, the little X-rated peep shows. <laughs> and we managed to do that and, and without getting caught. <laughs> one is, is kind of a funny one. Um, it was after, I think our junior year, may have been senior year after the annual cash boff fundraiser. And um, we got to bartend some of that. I know I did. Um, and after we cleaned up and everything, I noticed a keg was kind of stashed away in a closet. Um, so my mind, my devious mind began working and I enlisted Tebow, uh, Jim Twombly, a couple other folks. And we ended up putting that, this was like the next day, and it was, I think, Memorial Weekend that we were, but we decided, hey, well, here's our caper. And Twombly and myself, and maybe somebody else, because I remember being heavy, we carried it through the downstairs corridor that led into the gym. And as we're walking down, who comes the other way but Paul Martell? <laughs> so we're shitting bricks. Uh, but we say, hey, hey, Mr. Martell, how you doing? And, and I'm straining, I'm trying not to strain, but we walked by him, he didn't notice. And so we went through the gym, carrying it out. And there was Tebow with his um, red convertible. We opened up his trunk and threw it in. So, I mean, that was a fun caper and a lot of laughs and a lot of memories about that. Did not lose three or four years of school. You know, we got mixed up according to what our first class was after that. But you were always a 107, a 101 guy. The 101 was the smart guys. Everybody knew that. Uh, and I still, when we talk about homerooms, guys will tell me, oh, I was one of the dumb guys. I was in 113. I'm like, well, obviously, you weren't dumb. You know, you were in the school. But 
And we're talking a, a pretty steep slope when you start comparing yourself to those guys in 101. Uh, but uh, yeah, 107, I was, re was real happy being right dead center, you know, uh, three before and three behind. Uh, I had to take early morning chemistry uh, or else it wouldn't fit in my, in my schedule. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, so I took that horrible uh, early morning <laughs> chemistry class with Mr. Gates um, that um, uh, every time we went to the lab, Dave Weiss squirted um, me with distilled water from across the room. <laughs> And I'd go to mass after because it was before mass, and then I'd go to mass, and I'd be wet from chemistry class. By the end of freshman year, and one of the things that I had put down on on my list here was that I think I made not fifty friends, but close to fifty acquaintances when I went out for freshman football, because there were a lot of guys who got cut, as I recall. But you started meeting people. You okay. Milford, you're a big guy. You go with these lime. You go with uh, Fred, and you go with Kellett. You guys are big boys. And all you got other guys, Kalachi and Ruggieri, you know, you guys go that way. Um, so I think I started getting acclimated right away. But as, I, as every uh, semester went by, I was in class with different guys. And you'd get to know them. Um, and I think in the beginning, I was a 103 guy they kind of kept us with our class, didn't they? So you only got to know those 30 guys unless you were in an outside activity. Uh, so sophomore year, I, to my knowledge, they jumbled us up somehow. And I don't know how they did it on math skills or language skills or who could fit it into the skit. Who was the scheduler back in those days? It could have been Mr. Conway, God rest his soul, or who knows who made the schedule? My wife used to make the schedules at uh, St. Joe and some of the schools that she was with. And some of the reasons for doing it, you know, it might have been a carpool that they needed to be in, you know, to get to school. Um, so I'd say freshman year was pretty good, learning a lot of names, putting names with faces. Uh, but sophomore year, I felt totally comfortable. And then meeting all kinds of guys, you know, that was biology. That was, you know, we, we just got mixed up. We weren't with the same guys, in my case, from 103. And right from there, it took off. And I could, back at the end of senior year, I could put a name with every face. Let me give you a little funny Mike Burke story. Okay. Freshman year, he was, I think, in the, uh, what do you call the theater group? Dolphin Players. Yes. And um, we were always interested in having beer. Uh, and so he got some stage makeup and um, they put a beard and mustache on me. And I went into the grocery store in Del Mar, uh, just west of Skinker, <laughs> and tried to buy beer. And I think I succeeded. Um, but a couple guys, older guys, were getting something behind me and they're snickering and going, it's Eberly. <laughs> and it, it was just, it was hilarious. <laughs> And thanks, Mike Burke, for making me do that. I would I would be remiss if I didn't talk about that. Yeah, because my mom still recalls. Yeah, I think it was after it was after prom. We had a breakfast at our house on Westminster, and uh, she and my aunt uh, did all the cooking. And uh, ever I mean, it was everybody came way into the the night and morning and next day but she talks about the number of scrambled eggs and bacon and sausage and everything else that they made and people ate and uh that was nice uh people uh people showed it up and it was uh it was a lots of fun yeah and 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 she re and she's definitely re recalls that you know and, uh, one thing that somebody may not mention was playing hangman with phlegm so, and what Flem will remember, and probably Tom Gettleman, I'm not sure anybody else will, will Vita Blue. Vita Blue was a pitcher for the A's, and he was the all-time most difficult on hangman. I think more men were hung on Vita Blue than at the Nuremberg trials. A couple of things that I remember from senior year that uh, uh, really struck me. 
Uh, and they weren't so much about SLU as they were about uh, uh, the world at the time. Um, you know, I remember in um, uh, November of uh, 70, 70, I was 18 years old. Uh, and so in the spring, I went through the draft. Uh, and um, the, uh, <laughs> I, 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 the, the day they were going to pick lottery numbers, uh, I, I went out with three other guys from SLU. I don't remember who they were. I just remember there were four of us and we were in a car and we were going to get our uh, selective service numbers. It's kind of a big day for us. We're seniors, you know, we're planning to go to college, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I remember uh, going to a cemetery with two six packs of beer uh, to drink beer and um, uh, listen for our, our draft lottery numbers. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was an experience that really struck me because, uh, you know, uh, this was something that potentially could change people's lives. And uh, our way of dealing it with it was, you know, making fun of it and, you know, getting drunk. Um, and I, I remember, you know, one guy who in the car got a very low number. Um, uh, two guys in the car got very high numbers. Uh, I got number 125. And they had announced uh, before uh, that date that they would be calling up to 125 in that year. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like, okay, now what do I do? Um, and um, uh, I remember going to school the next day and talking to other guys, and some guys were already uh, signing up for reserves. Um, and I pretty much uh, decided I'm just going to roll the dice. Um, but my overall impression of the whole thing was, you know, it's probably a fair way to do this, but it's just, you know, ludicrous. When I got there, I remember the first experience was uh, I knew, I, you know, I was in love with football from a long time, you know, way back when. And the football practice, a tryout started uh, before school started. So, that, you know, so before even classes began, uh, we were uh, on that lower dust field uh, trying out. And I, I remember uh, Paul Martell very vividly and, uh, he didn't quite know what to make of me. And, you know, I, you know, and I, again, as a sort of a transplant, uh, I don't know that he was even sort of like expecting that, you know, that I was going to be trying out. And, uh, but I did, I did okay. And I remember him, you know, pulling me out of the, uh, the uh, pastoral line and asking me a zillion questions about whether I had, you know, uh, had any training or you know, played on any teams or whatnot. And I came from a very rural era in Alabama. So the only teams we had were the people kids in the neighborhood. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. He says, okay. And then I went back in the line. Uh, so that was my first experience. Uh, well, kind of, uh, we kind of came out of the Chrome magazine. There was uh, Kevin Polito and uh, Len Tengis. Uh, of course, Steve, Dan Shaljo, uh, we had a band that formed out of that group, the uh, Captain America Red, White, and Blues Band, actually played a gig at uh, Rosati Kane for, our, I think, their one and only appearance, uh, but they, uh, them, John Kish was the guitar player of the group, although he wasn't as involved with all the other social things as that was, but uh, certainly well respected for his uh, artistic and guitar ability. You know, he, uh, you know, like I said, it was a great time of, of my life. So, and established, you know, I don't know how many people can say they, they got 15 friends from high school. You know, I, I there's not too many people I talked to about that. Uh, so, uh, and, and it, it's always the same thing, and it's always as funny as it was told, you know, years ago. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to those meetings, you know. I was, uh, Mike O'Hare, uh, mom, had a convertible, and we sat on the, you know, on the on back of the back seat and saw this. We were kind of a little farther back in the parade. So as we were going by CBC and everything, we saw it start, you know, all of a sudden, and we were like, oh, my gosh. Well, we got hit. Mrs. Uh, O'Hare's car was damaged. It, 
had eggs stuck to it and everything. Um, as I recall, we had to give up the prize money for best float to get Mrs. O'Hare's car taken care of. But, <laughs> and then the last parade, <laughs> it was, they called it off after that. So 107 has that distinction, you know, that our, our float was the last winning parade float in that tradition. I, I you know, I kind of almost think they ought to go bring it back. I don't know that taking the parade in front of CBC was such a good idea. They could have maybe had a, a little better route, but uh, I think it was traditional. <laughs> if I had to peg one incident or one uh, exposure that left a mark on me, it was a senior retreat down at the White House. And it was, uh, <laughs> it, 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 was um, it helped to establish my faith but I will never forget the spiritual feeling that I had at that retreat. I'll never forget the camaraderie that developed as a result of that retreat. I'll never, and I always, and I've told people this before. I thought, I felt as if I experienced God. Um, senior year, our retreat was another one. They put us in small groups. Uh, I was with uh, Tom Banger and uh, Bill Caputo, and I think Tom Barry was the, uh, the other person, but uh, we were told to describe one another and draw pictures on butcher block paper that indicated something about that person. And the guys uh, decided for me, they drew a hand holding a beer can uh, with the word gusto written across it. And I was pretty much taken aback at their uh, feeling that I was a person that exhibited gusto and, and it really kind of, um, showed me that I didn't really know what, how other people viewed me. Uh, you know, mine were based, you know, I didn't, play, I didn't play in any sports or uh, because I was working every day there. So it kind of precluded that, that in my size and basic maturity precluded it as well. But, you know, I finished, I started there when I was, I just turned 13 a, a couple of months before. So I was, I was young in there and I was, uh, I may have hit five, feet tall when I was a freshman, uh, but, you know, under a hundred pounds, I think 95 was the highest I got back then. And I didn't finish that much greater than that. I grew five inches in college. So I, and, and academically I started in, in, uh, you know, 109, which, you know, was slightly to the wrong side of middle, but I finished strongly, you know, in the, in the bottom 5% of our class academically. So, so the, you know, in the two ways you are judged in high school or people excel in high school, which would either be athletically or academically, I was the bottom. I was on the student council. That was a good experience, too. Uh, obviously, you were. That was important in trying to take care of it. I can remember um, doing the spring carnival. And I think you were a big part of that as well. As a senior, we were going over the booths and what we're going to do and so forth. And I think it was you had all this information from the year previous. And they said, well, we had one booth, I think really lost money. And I said, well, who was that? And he looked at me and go, well, that was your booth, Dave. <laughs> I said, oh, she was, sorry. <laughs> uh, but we corrected that, but that was a lot of fun. And that is, there was a, it was either described as a uh, march or a walk for peace. Uh, and um, I, I remember um, Joe McDonald, who was another senior in our class, uh, was the one who told me about it. And he uh, uh, invited me to go to a planning meeting at, at St. Louis University. Uh, and I went with him and they kind of talked about what they were going to do. They basically organized all these uh, high schools to have kids go out and go on a 30 mile walk. Um, so uh, I signed up for that. And uh, uh, I, I remember going on that walk that day and the people who were with me, I remember John Bentrop was there. Uh, I, I remember Paul Shum was one of the group. Uh, uh, I believe Jim Farrell was there. Um, and um, um, there, were, uh, there were a few other guys. Uh, and I remember we started and ended at SLU. It was a 30 mile walk. So it took like, what, 10 hours. Um, 
shortly after we started, we hooked up with some girls from Narinx Hall. There were like, I don't know, half a dozen of them. They were really cute. Uh, they walked the whole way with us. And, um, you know, it was just a, a, a wonderful event because in comparison with kind of the whole thing of getting my draft number, um, I, I, I felt at the end of the day that, you know, this thing obviously has no effect on anybody. But it did give me a sense that, you know, people can do things just by getting together and making small steps. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was impressed by that. I uh, um, was definitely impressed by that. And uh, that was kind of a, a, a big event for me. Well, there's another thing about freshman year. When I walked into the rec room and saw 30 pool tables and you could play pool and you could play ping pong and you could play wall ball. It was like, I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. What's, go what's going on? I this is my high school? you got to be kidding me. There were a couple of things, but I think the thing that probably had the greatest impact of my life, which may be something you're not going to hear from any of the other guys, was going with Father Peeper to Europe for seven weeks in the summer between junior and senior year. I really feel like um, um, it exposed me to the rest of the world. Uh, I kind of grew up because he just kind of left us on our own. In fact, some of us didn't even come in at night a couple of times. We don't want to talk about that. But um, I remember discovering, along with Pat Goki, that when we got to London, there was no drinking age. So that night, we went to a place I still remember called A Bunch of Grapes. And uh, I matched him beers for martinis. I drank martinis. He drank beers. I think he fell off the bar stool before I did. So, In senior year, I was chosen to give the senior speech at the father-son banquet. And I had never given a public speech before. And I have to tell you, uh, there are about a thousand people in the audience and I was absolutely terrified. But I stood up and I gave a short, heartfelt uh, speech about our senior project, the importance of having fathers in our lives, and the love that we had for our fathers. And uh, it was very well received. And I got a number of very nice compliments from um, students and faculty in the weeks that followed. So that was just one of many memorable uh, events, but it really had a, a big impact on me. Um, I don't think you can put this into the uh, video, but I'll tell you a quick story about that spring carnival. For some reason, we had to go into the Jesuits' um, kitchen, you know, to get something, or maybe ice or whatever. And I can't remember who I was with, but you go in this huge walk-in refrigerator, you recall? There were half barrels of beer <laughs> all around. And we got the idea, we found an empty trash can we put a half barrel into this trash can put a lid on it and carried it out of the kitchen dragged it across the upper field to a car <laughs> put it in the car and eventually uh made our way to uh imbibing with that thing. <laughs> i have talked to and some of our other classmates have talked to guys who were a year ahead of us and who were a year behind us. And those guys have talked about how special they thought our class was. Uh, I also have the experience of three other brothers, three brothers of mine that went through there. And, you know, they all think the world of St. Louis U High, but their experiences and their class just isn't the same as ours. Um, I think Probably over the course of four years, I probably had interactions with just about everybody in our class, obviously some much more than others. And I can say that I really don't have a bad memory or a bad thought of any of those guys. And I really, um, I don't know what it was. Maybe it just all came together, but they were all just good guys. And they were guys that, you know, of character and, but they were also guys you could have a lot of fun with. So um, we just happened to, it, we just happened to hit the right one, I guess. It, 
I guess, before homecoming game. I guess it was homecoming, before homecoming parade. And we built our class, built a float over at uh, Steve Pelletier's house. And um, I remember getting together and trying to organize folks and to get that together and make this float. And somebody had a pickup truck, not a pickup truck, a flatbed trailer. Um, we put this, um, I forget, we had something domed and we had chicken wire and we stuffed it with tissue, I guess. Um, and then we got in the parade. And the parade was a mess because people started being bad <laughs> and, and not not controlling themselves. And then I think that was the last year they had the parade, I think. I thought back and I wish I had a great, like, God, this was a hysterical moment or anything. I think from a, a humor point of view, the thing I remember, and I probably heard this from a lot of guys, is I remember those senior year pep rallies. And they were, I mean, they were classics. These things, were, you know, at least the way I remember them, I, they're just funny and meaningful. And, uh, you know, it. So, so that kind of stands out as kind of a funny thing. Uh, yeah, you know, the other thing I remember is the pep rally. And I remember how, how creative Tim Rogers was, right? And just, you know, th thinking that as a freshman saying, holy crap, that guy is, you know, how he could take a song and rewrite the lyrics and, and you know, into a theme, you know, as quickly as he did, I thought was pretty astounding. Tim Rogers, and this is the thing about our class, we had some of the funniest people in that class, humorous could make you just laugh your guts out. Tim Rogers is one. And the way he uh, always put together those pep rallies was always a highlight. And he would always run past the allotted time, encountering the wrath of Father Wayne, or as Tim would say, Father Wayne, uh, every time and somehow would talk his way out of getting a demerit or jug or something, we're getting late and always ran late. But those were always fun. I always enjoyed those. Um, the junior ring dance because I was on the committee to help with the decorations. Uh, I, I most remember making bats out of toilet paper rolls and putting them on strings that somehow they were able to fly across the auditorium above the crowd. And of course, you know, getting your ring and being with the person at the dance that, you know, it was just, just a wonderful, seemed to be a wonderful experience. If I had to peg one incident or one uh, exposure that left a mark on me. It was a senior retreat down at the White House. And it was, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was, um, it helped to establish my faith. But I will never forget the spiritual feeling that I had at that retreat. I'll never forget the camaraderie that developed as a result of that retreat. I'll never, and I always, and I've told people this before, I thought, I felt as if I experienced God because it was just it was just madness, and also we had a jukebox going, so that was the, one of the things that stands out. I I blame that mad rush for food for all of my eating disorders since then, <laughs> but uh, that was one. The other thing that that I really uh, remember is going to the football games on Friday night. That was a lot of fun. 69, was it 69 with the moonwalk, the, the Manson killings, you know, um, uh, Woodstock, you know, all these incredible events taking place that uh, really helped shape what was going on. Yeah, that, that's a great, that's a great point. But I do have a funny story. It just occurred to me, we're thinking about faculty members. This goes back to freshman year. This goes back to football. And I'm a freshman in the stands at O'Fallon Tech and you probably went to football games at O'Fallon Tech. And Father Kellett was a very revered faculty member. I mean, worship. And Tim Kellett was no relation to Father Kellett, was one of my buddies from freshman football, who we always, you know, whipped a lot of SHIT on each other all the time. And so there's a track around the football field, and then stands are behind the track. I'm up there with... I don't even remember who. And Tim Kellett is, is uh, walking in front of me on the track. And I'm up in the stands about 10 rows and I yell, hey, Kellett, fuck you, Kellett, fuck you. And there was a, 
a head channel leader named Terry Ferris, senior, got a big billiken on his sweatshirt. Apparently he comes running up three of the stands, grabs me by my shirt, says, if you ever say fuck Father Kellen again, I'll kill you. <laughs> I said, it wasn't, it wasn't Father Kellen. I wasn't talking about Father Kellen. I was talking about Tim Kellen. He says, I'm just telling you, you freshmen, you don't ever do that again. <laughs> so, so damn young. Yeah. Yeah. And silly and stupid. You know, it's just, I mean, it's kind of amazing all the shit we didn't know. We thought we did. Right. Just, you know, right. 107 has that distinction, you know, that our, our float was the last winning parade float in that tradition. I, I you know, I kind of almost think they ought to go bring it back. I don't know that taking the parade in front of CBC was such a good idea. <laughs>